Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, I'm Melanie Ruffell from the Reddit Institute and um, today we're bringing to you another of our um, webinars from the HVN Science of Food uh, webinar series. So today we're going to be talking about the challenges and opportunities in developing high value foods with validated health claims, which is effectively what the Science of Food program um, is all about. And this is a series of webinars that we're running um, over the next few years for HVN um, in the Science of Food program. Um, we've currently already uploaded to the HVN website a uh, webinar on um, IP, so top tips in IP um, in high value foods, and also uh, the um, important aspects of regulatory considerations in developing high value uh, foods with health claims. So this webinar is talking about um, uh, the overview of the Science of Food program and how the Reddit Institute is contributing uh, to HVN um, by delivering these activities to help produce the foods to go into the clinical trials to be tested within the HVN program. So um, without any further ado, I will introduce you to our two speakers today from the Reddit Institute. We have our distinguished Professor Hajinder Singh, uh, the director of the Institute and leading the Science of Food program, and also Dr. Alejandra Acevedo Fani, who is a key researcher on the Science of Food program um, and a research officer at the Reddit Institute. Um, so I shall hand over to them now and um, please do send in any questions um, as, as they come up following viewing this uh, webinar. We have our contact details available. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> So in today's webinar, we are going to look at um, just a very brief overview of Science of Food program. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the challenges that we normally face in developing functional foods with validated health claims. Then I'll hand over to Alejandra to talk about uh, some of the opportunities that uh, there are in high value food space, especially talking about some of the examples from our um, early work in the science of food program. Food can be functional in its natural state, it could be natural whole food, uh, but the condition of course, this whole food has to have certain concentrations of bioactive compounds. And that can occur naturally or can be enhanced through certain type of growing conditions, certain type of varieties of plants may have that concentration. It can be achieved through certain type of breeding in animal production. Uh, and of course, it can be created through genetic modification. So there'll be examples would be like um, oily fish, you know, salmon and sardines and tuna will have a naturally high levels of omega-3. And uh, you'll have things like berries with high amounts of anthocyanins. You'll have things like oats with high amount of um, fiber and so on. And then the other uh, category is so-called enriched products, where we actually take everyday food and then we can add certain bioactive compounds into it. You know, things like you have seen um, additional probiotics, omega-3 uh, fatty acids um, and polyphenols and so on into, into different types of products. And these are called enriched functional foods. So this is the most common way of producing functional foods commercially. So what happens with this one, and the third category is that the, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. The third category is uh, so-called altered products. So we can have actually have a food product where we can alter something so that it becomes more functional or has a less adverse effect on health. So here example will be if you, if you remove saturated fat, for example, or trans fats from a food so that uh, food free from fat, free from sugars, uh, free from uh, trans fats could be considered as sort of functional in the sense that actually uh, it does not impact your, it doesn't uh, adversely affect your health. And the fourth category, which is sort of less common, is you can do something to the active food so that actually you can modify the bioactive components within that food so that uh, it can improve its bioavailability. So in, in other words, it actually become more beneficial to health. So things like you can modify proteins by enzymatic means to generate, generate bioactive peptides. Within the system, you can modify 
certain type of uh, heat treatments to alter the bioavailability of some of the polyphenols, for example. So there's many um, type of examples where bioavailability can be improved through uh, processing treatments. But the most common uh, example, as I mentioned before, of functional food that's commercially viable is, is the enriched products. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So these kind of functional foods, as I mentioned before, are created by adding concentrates or extracts of identified bioactives compounds into more or less everyday product. Now you see many things in the market. So you know, um, for example, these phytosterol containing products, um, some examples shown in here, so they are known to reduce cholesterol. So in that case, the phytosterols are extracted from another source and then put into yogurt, put into cereals, put into um, margarines and so on. So that's quite a common way of, quite a successful functional food, I must say. And then uh, probiotics, uh, you have seen many of those products in the market, exactly the same thing. So the probiotics have been um, created separately and then added into products that create a huge range of category of um, dairy-based products. And also, more recently, probiotics going into non-dairy systems as well. And the third example is the uh, omega-3. So you have seen omega-3 enriched products as well. So that's the sort of the idea behind creating enriched products or the functional food through this category. The advantage of this is, of course, is that the delivery is controlled. So you know exactly the amount of bioactive that's being added and formulated into a product. Then you have the ability to take that defined product and validate its um, health impact through clinical trials. And also possible to understand the mechanisms of action uh, within that uh, defined system, as opposed to if we are dealing with whole food or much more complex um, system where uh, multiple bioactive components can interact and, and you don't know where the effect is coming from. So in creating these enriched products, there are many challenges because depending on the kind of bioactive that we may want to add, uh, it can create many technical formulation issues. This is related to because the bioactives actually are chemical compounds, of course, they differ widely in their molecular, physical, chemical, and physiological properties. And in many cases, the, we need to consider the compatibility of the compound within the food matrix and also the processing conditions and consider what's going to happen during storage and transport and so on. So these are some of the crop, uh, common problems that I mentioned here. So things like solubility problems, extracted bioactive compounds often are not soluble in aqueous phase or even this oil phase sometimes. So th those issues have to be overcome. Uh, consideration of the impact of bioactive on flavor, taste, and texture issues, and how we ensure physiological activities are retained during processing is another big issue. So we need to ensure uh, that bioactive is accessible and bioavailable uh, during digestion. And also the kind of impact food matrix can have on the kinetics of release need to be considered when designing these type of foods. To overcome these problems, there has been a lot of research done on development of delivery systems. So what the delivery systems are able to encapsulate or protect these bioactive compounds and then allow easier incorporation of these into foods. Uh, as I mentioned before, these bioactive compounds can, can be hydrophobic, can be hydrophilic, they can be amphiphilic, and they create problems in terms of taste and stringency. It can be uh, microorganisms in some cases. So what we do is we take, the, depending on the type of bioactive it is, so we can put them into these various kinds of delivery systems. They may be consisting of proteins, consisting of gels, uh, emulsions, liposomes, the many, many possibilities of uh, protecting and delivering uh, bioactives into foods. But many of them are not really um, valid in a real food system. 
a uh, lot of research has been done on these and, and the laboratory scale as a model system, but we have not seen many applications in real foods and testing the efficacy of these uh, in, in human clinical trials as well. So considering the overall uh, impact of development of foods for health or functional foods, there are many things we need to consider. Um, so if you're looking to producing that at the production scale, for example, um, the, the, these kind of foods. So we need to ensure we have a reliable and cons consistent source of active ingredients and the volume the required and the regulatory status and so on need to be considered. And the specification and safety and efficacy of these need to be proven and tested before you even consider for food application. Then we have to consider um, the characterization of the bioactive and the food format it might go into, the compatibility issues I talked about before, uh, whether the kind of food we have chosen uh, will impact its bioactivity. For example, if you take something that's heat sensitive, probiotics, for example, and trying to put into UHT milk or UHT product, it's not going to work because the heat sensitivity of uh, probiotics is, is, is uh, very high, you know, so even pasteurization type treatment will kill most of the activities. So that those are the sort of issues. And if you're trying to use omega-3 in a liquid product containing high amounts of oxygen, you're going to have a huge problem with uh, the um, oxidation. So, so there are many things to be considered. What's the right format for a certain type of um, bioactive delivery? Sometimes these structures we choose or the, the metrics we choose actually can impact on the bioaccessibility, bioavailability as well. So all that consideration um, need to be brought into the formulation considerations. So once we've done this, we, done, we identify the ingredient, then we figured out where it need to go to which food format. Then of course, uh, need to consider cost models. Uh, the, if you're a commercial operation, we need to consider the advantage over competitors in terms of patents and control of supply and so on. So we do provide that information about patents in different areas of uh, HVN um, health platforms uh, to the companies as well. And that allows us to look at freedom to operate and what might be the processing constraints uh, as well. And finally, uh, also in the front end and the back end as well, of course, we need to consider regulatory and safety approvals. Is it a new ingredient? Would it require grass, grass approval or novel food status? So all that need to be considered. And then uh, alongside development of uh, these products, one need to consider the consumer acceptance. Uh, that includes sensory, uh, shelf life, and other related uh, matters. And then in the end, of course, the, the, after the clinical trial, we need to, the communication is extremely important and the type of health claim that can be made uh, on the final product. So with that one, I stop for a while and then pass on to Alejandra to talk about the next phase. Thank you, Professor Hajinder. Uh, for this last section of the webinar, I will be walking you through the opportunities for innovation in the high value food space using examples from the Science of Food program. So research as such play a key role in the food uh, in the process of food innovation. Why? Because the generation of new knowledge actually can lead to new technologies or even improve of existing technologies new products as well, processes, service, as, uh, and solutions. But to really be able to step out of the crowd, you often need a combination of fundamental research and applied research. Now I will draw your attention to Enriched Products, uh, which has been already well discussed by Professor Hajinder. And, and as he mentioned as well, in the process of developing this type of uh, products and, and get validated health claims, uh, there's a number of key aspects that should be considered. And first of all, uh, you need to, you might want to identify 
what is the bioactive compound or substance that is going to be responsible or creating that health effect. Then it comes to the process of incorporation or addition of that product into formulation, which often may or might not come with uh, a lot of challenges, as also was mentioned before. In this process, is, it is very important to uh, observe what are the interactions between the bioactive and the food matrix, because um, it is um, desirable to achieve interactions that does not affect the final quality properties of the product, as well as the sensory aspects. In the end, your customer will always want to have a food that tastes good, and then everything else will come later. But if it's a product that uh, is very healthy but doesn't taste good, it might be a downside. Once you create this novel type of food, you might also want to see the, whether this novel ingredient or novel processing you're, uh, you are uh, creating has an impact on uh, the gastrointest uh, on how the product is broken down into during your digestion. And you can achieve this, uh, you can obtain this information using in vitro model. And it, it is often uh, also very important to correlate this information with preclinical and clinical trials. And overall, just to highlight, uh, you need to keep looking at the regulation and IP landscape during this process to make sure that um, the ingredients or the bioactive, bioactive substance that are intended to be used for the health claims are suitable as a food ingredients and also to the markets that are going to be sold. Here I'm bringing you some of the examples we have um, of the products and technologies we have done in the trench one within the science of food program. And uh, we've done, we tested a number of, uh, we created a number of new food prototypes as well as a new ingredient technology. And for the second of today's webinar, I am focused uh, on two main examples. One is the soup project we work uh, on. It's about a fortified daily for reducing the risk of diabetes. And the second example I am bringing today is a snack for reducing also the risk of diabetes. In the routine project, we work under the umbrella of high value nutrition the science of a food program uh, work together with the metabolic health platform. On our side, we uh, help the, to create the prototypes or food uh, that were, were going to be tested or that were tested in the clinical trial. And the clinical trial in this case was run by the, by the metabolic platform. Routing, I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next, in the next slides about this compound. And the interest of rooting in this particular study is uh, due to its uh, important health effects on diabetes prevention. Rooting is a molecule that belongs to the polyphenol family. It's a plant-based ingredient that can be found in many plant-based uh, uh, food and non-food materials. It is also quite an uh, 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 antioxidant. Um, which might be related with many of the health um, benefits related to, to it. More importantly, this anti-diabetic effect has been observed in, observed in, uh, in a number of studies done both in vitro and in vivo. In fact, the scientific community has proposed a number of mechanisms by which routing um, can have that um, have effect on managing diabetics in our body. Here I'm listing them, but these are just hypotheses, hypotheses at the moment and are being tested. The interesting thing about routing is that all these studies always use tablets uh, from, uh, from pharmacy uh, or capsules containing the compound, but really the effect, uh, these beneficial effect have never been tested in an enriched food. And that was the aim of the clinical trial. 
So when we moved into the food prototype for this trial, we had a number of requirements that needed to be made, um, um, that needed to be achieved uh, for, uh, for the trial. First of all, we worked on a specific nutrition composition for pre-diabetic patients. Uh, another important aspect of this uh, for food product, we had to deliver 500 milligrams per serve. 500 milligrams of routine was the dose established for this clinical trial based on previous studies. It also had to be ready to eat and, uh, and comes in a convenient for format. What was the challenge that we found in this particular project? First of all, we realized after our research that there's no whole food uh, that contains such a high amount of protein that needed to be delivered in a food. Then the second idea we explored was the enriched food uh, type of functional foods, where we use isolated routing to enrich the food. And in the first uh, part of the project, we realized that routing also has a number of um, downsides. For example, uh, it has a bitter taste that can significantly modify the quality and the sensory aspect of any food. It is also pretty uh, insoluble in water-based foods, which made it difficult to formulate, to make the formulation. And another key point is that the, uh, it is uh, the absorption uh, in the gastrointestinal tract is also very low. It has been reported that uh, this might be due to its low solubility. So uh, in, in our exploration, we found an opportunity. The opportunity was to, to uh, create a technology that allow us to overcome some of these challenges. In this case, the result was the Flower Plus technology, which I'm going to explain to you in a, in a minute. The Flower Plus technology consists in a combination of proteins and flavonoids under control conditions to achieve uh, what we call uh, an interrupted flavonoid into a co-precipitate. So as you might see, at pH 11, both uh, molecules of rutin and the proteins are well soluble and dispersed and barely not interacting. But when we modify the conditions of the environment where this, these molecules are sitting in, they gradually start interacting more and more, creating these small complexes. When we got to this point, uh, we, although we got a nice system, with routing that could be delivered, it, it was not still high enough to achieve our final goal in the food product. Therefore, we keep exploring, and we found that uh, at the isoelectric points of the proteins, we found that co-precipitate that finally can turn into a powder, which are high um, with a high amount of routing, and this will allow us to work on a food product. I also want to mention that um, we, the, we found, we, we patented, we have a patent on this technology, which is now in the PCT stat status. And um, just to explain you a little bit more, what are the changes that we're able to create through this co-precipitation? First, first of all, we can see on this graph that the solubility of, uh, of the routing, isolated routing, versus the flower plus is significantly different. When you look at the particle size over to the changes of the particle size of the routing powder dissolved in, in water over time, you can see how the untreated routing really doesn't dissolve in water by um, looking at the, uh, that there's no changes in the initial particle size, or barely no changes. However, when you look at the flower plus, these um, um, particle size in water, we can see how those, those numbers drop very quickly, indicating the solubility is very good and uh, very well improved. At the microscopic level, we also saw changes 
which are basically uh, our uh, main explanation of how this system works. The untreated routing is very crystalline, which means the uh, minimal interaction with, with water molecules. When we do the precipitation with proteins, we're able to break down this um, crystalline structure and probably uh, make it more amorphous, which then this can interact better with water and improve the solubility. These are some of the key features we found in Flower Plus. We can deliver high amounts of fruiting. For example, each gram of uh, Flower Plus contains 500 grams, uh, milligrams of fruiting. We also improve the solubility of the, of the fruiting, making it easy to um, apply into a wider range of food products. And we also achieve uh, some improvements in terms of uh, bitter taste, um, of masking the bitter taste. Then what we used was, what, what we did was use in this ingredient to formulate the food. And the food format chosen for the clinical trial was a yogurt. And the yogurt, as I mentioned, has a specific formulation, low in fat and uh, without sugar, and so that it can be consumed by the for the participants. In the process of developing the product, we took into consideration a number of critical steps already mentioned. So the product development step where we uh, optimize not only the formulation, but also the, pro the, the process uh, to make it suitable uh, with this ingredient. And at the same time, we, the, the sensory test was incorporated into the process to get the best formulation possible. We also investigate what happened, whether flower plots were, were able to have any, uh, any change on the, on the known properties of the yogurt. Uh, some in vitro tests on the gastrointestinal behavior of the flower plot plus enriched yogurt was also done. This formulation was also scaled up in order to, um, to be able to support the clinical trials. Just to mention, we made about 250 and 400 kilograms per week at an, at an industrial scale. And we developed to, uh, this product um, and, and we delivered this product for the clinical trial in uh, every week. What I'm showing you here are some uh, pictures of how the product looked like. So uh, this yellow, um, yellow um, color in the product is due to the presence of the bioactive compound. We also fabricate a control sample with no routing for the clinical trial. And the pots were assembled into uh, boxes that contain seven, seven, um, seven yogurts one per, um, per each day. So this was a uh, one box correspond to one week of treatment. Here are some uh, of the key features of, these, uh, of the yogurt we came across with. So the flower plus enriched yogurt in terms of acceptability by a normal consumer, we could see uh, that the final formulation was rather acceptable. We not only evaluate a single spoon, uh, the, the, um, the response uh, with a single spoon, but we wanted to see uh, whether uh, it was possible to finish the complete serving size. This was very critical uh, to uh, make sure that the dose of fruiting was going to be um, consumed by the participants with no problem in terms of taste. In terms of the shell life, we observed changes that were no different, were no different from what is expected for this type of yogurt. So we conclude that flower plus and rooting in this case didn't modify much the sense, the, this, the shell life of the yogurt. In another study, we also investigate 
the digestion, the process of uh, Flavo Plus enriched yogurt. In this case, we compare a Flavo Plus enriched yogurt with a control root yogurt with no rooting, co-digested with a rooting capsule. The rooting capsule contains the same dose of rooting that the Flavo Plus enriched yogurt had. And we look at what, what, what occurred at the, gastrointestinal, at the gastric digestion stage and the small intestinal uh, digestion stage. In a nutshell, we observed that the flower plus enriched yogurt could um, had a um, different profile uh, release of rooting from the food matrix, and um, is the is the red line you can see here. And at the end of the gastric digestion, most of the rooting, almost 100%, was completely released. Uh, if you compare with the, um, the control plus the co-digested um, co with the routine pill, we, not, we, we, we did observe a different release and also at the final stage, um, only 60% uh, of the initial routing in the product was released. Uh, in the small intestine, we also observed that the flour plus yogurt was more efficient at protecting rooting during, uh, during this phase. And this is just an schematic representation of how we think the flower plus um, can interact, for example, in this particular food system. Uh, because uh, flower plus, uh, again, is a co-precipitate which contains proteins and uh, and rooting and trapped it. We believe that the protein belonging to the flower plus is able to interact with the proteins uh, of the yogurt in a nicer way, uh, helping to uh, get an homogeneous distribution of the, of the bioactive compound within the food matrix and with less uh, side, um, uh, less effect on the, on the, on the final product, on the structure of the product. When you have the crystals alone, it, it might cause, um, it, it doesn't really um, interact with the food matrix, and then this directly affects the release during gastrointestinal digestion. Now I'm moving to the final uh, um, example, the two order project. And this is a, a different approach, in this case, uh, we worked on a formula, we were in collaboration with uh, the metabolic platform again to test the effect of this uh, product on, um, on diabetes uh, management. And the product was, was developed in collaboration with the Food Pilot Edible Research and also New Cookie Tech Book. The product was an enriched nut bar co-developed again in collaboration with all these entities, was a plant-based product. And the key here was uh, the enrichment with New Zealand indigenous ingredients. In this case, the work, the, work, uh, the innovation um, in, in, of this product is the ident identification of these ingredients, which are unique in their, in their sense. In terms of nutrition, the proteins were high in protein, uh, the bars, sorry, the, the, the nut bars were high in protein, low in carbohydrates, and low in glycemic index. Here are some of the pictures of the final product. Again, uh, we, we were able to not only create the test product, but also a control for the clinical trial at Biotop Plants uh, production. And with this, um, I will finish my slides and I'll hand over to Hajinder for the final words. Thank you, Alejandra. Just to finish off, um, just a few comments on the other opportunities for innovation in this space. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are a number of bioactive delivery platforms being developed and many of them are actually applied to drug delivery at the moment. Uh, but I think there's a huge opportunity to learn from those approaches 
and see if we can improve the delivery of bioactives uh, into foods. And that uh, in, may involve development of much more advanced delivery systems, things like um, the delivery system that actually able to deliver bioactives at specific sites of the GIT track. So it's a more precise delivery and, and more site-directed delivery concepts. I think they'll come into foods in the future uh, for development of more advanced uh, foods. So that's just a one area that can be, I think, quite open for innovation. And in fact, at the Ritter Institute, we do have a, quite a significant program underway to look at the futuristic uh, programs for um, advanced delivery of bioactives. The um, other one is obviously this idea around how you protect the natural benefits of whole foods. So what kind of work you need to do to be able to retain activities within the whole food. And that is obviously quite important. Something like we have a unique characteristics in our kiwi fruit, for example. Uh, we have uh, certain varieties of berries, for example, with high amounts of anthocyanins. So can we look at some ways of protecting without actually taking things out, but be able to use those whole foods, but ensure that the, um, we can actually claim or we can prove that bioactive compounds are still present in high concentrations and can, be, uh, can show health impacts in humans. So for this, I think we need to look at some of the newer technologies because the traditional technologies probably will not be sufficient to, to, um, to actually um, optimize the bioactivities. So because many of the traditional technology, if you use high pressure, if you use homogenization, heat treatments, UHTs, uh, traditional processes of um, filling and cooking and I think it's quite complicated to retain those uh, activities. So we have to, if you're looking at, if you're turning that whole food into some sort of uh, shelf-stable, processable form, uh, then there is a potential to use some of the newer technologies, things like um, MATH system. This is microwave-assisted thermal technologies where the temperature used is quite low. So you can actually potentially retain bioactivity uh, at the same time, you can achieve shelf life. So it's just come down to the balance between shelf life achievement with the whole food and retention of Y activity. So the processing is really done to improve shelf life in many cases and improve safety. So some of the new technology like high pressure homogenization, uh, static high pressures, um, shock wave processing uh, for meat, for example, is coming in where the heat load on the product is quite low. So that means we can retain bioactivity, but at the same time, they are tend to kill the pathogenic bacteria. So you could achieve, so that's the kind of area I think that'll grow uh, into the future for protection and new ways of processing uh, some of these um, um, the natural whole foods. Yeah, I think that's that's where we stop, and um, so we are. I hope this was useful and uh, useful information for you. And we are happy to. Um, you can send just send us your questions to Alejandra. Uh, there's an email there or me if you wanted to. And uh, with that, thank you very much.